Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Monday morning edition, the breaking news edition. I'm Kevin Paulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 13th, 2017. Okay, George, welcome to the Monday show. A lot of people probably don't realize this, but you're a full-time priest. And even though we plan on recording every Friday, it doesn't always work out. Because your church is growing, you told me you had 15 people show up on Sunday looking for a new parish. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you Episcopalians really don't like that. We had to go, oh, uh, I'm sorry, if your grandparents didn't worship in this church, you're not welcome. Yeah, that's right. You're having to fight that fight every weekend, it seems. Um, <laughs> Well, no, I mean we're we're very fortunate. We uh, have uh, been doing a uh, outreach to the community, and it's starting to pay off. And uh, I'm hoping uh, of those fifteen, maybe more than half will come back and uh, stick around for the long haul. That's that's amazing because uh, up here in the Northeast we don't get that. The people who show up at our church are lost and asking for directions uh, up in the, <clears throat> the pagan post-Christian uh, Connecticut. It's kind of the way things work out. Um, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, uh, Jill was in a little fender bender. Not her fault this weekend. Uh, somebody here on Route 15, which is a, a major artery in Connecticut, was not paying attention. Uh, they were using one of these and the steering wheel at the same time and came up on a little slowdown. Jill had already slowed down and they, they tagged her back bumper uh, after she had stopped, pushed her car into another car, and out pops the guy in the in the front car that she just uh, moved into, and probably one of the best dramatic acting scenes you've ever uh, witnessed. Gets out, holding his neck, holding his back, bouncing around. Oh, oh, oh what was me? My son, who's in the passenger side, looks at my my wife and says, well, "What's going on here?" When Jill calmly looks at him and says, well, he thinks he won the lottery. Uh, <clears throat> which probably in Connecticut with our lawyers is, is true. Um, you were telling me that uh, you get to work in your daughter's car this week. Yes, my daughter said, oh, Daddy, can you fix my car? The check engine light's on. Uh -huh. I said, sure. Well, you take my car back up to Atlanta and I'll work on your car. And so she dropped it off. And sure enough, the check engine light was on, but also the side passenger mirror was gone. The front <laughs> bumper was about three, four inches separated from the body of the car. And it looked like she had uh, been bowling on the uh, on the hood. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, did, did you hit something? Oh, well, yes, uh, but uh, you can fix it, can't you? And I actually don't mind, because I now get to play with my acetylene torch. And... Uh, <laughs> So next show, Kevin, if I have no eyebrows, uh, you know what happened. <laughs> I, I I can think of all the priests I know in the Episcopal and Anglican churches, and I don't know that many that have settling torches. You just pick this up at the <laughs> hardware stores, and I need that, dear. That's, you know, I mean, <laughs> hey, doesn't any any self-respecting American male has an acetylene torch, doesn't he? And is it rock? I can't imagine th what I would have to do. Uh, the favors I would have to, to, to provide dear Jill in order to have a welding torch in my garage. <sighs> but Kevin, it's so convenient. You know, if you want to have a barbecue cookout, you don't mess with lighter fluid and matches. Get out the torch. Uh. <laughs> oh, it's time for s'mores. <laughs> yes, I suppose. Uh, we got a lot of news to cover. Um, this one, the first story is a, a Canadian story. And I, I want to intro the Canadian story by talking about um, an analogy here in America. In America, the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, cannot call up a bishop, let's pick a random bishop, Bishop of LA, uh, and say you're fired. There's a process. The process, you know, uh, Article 4 or whatever, you go through a disciplinary process. Um, he can't call up a priest and say you're fired, uh, probably not even in his own diocese. And so we have established laws here within the church and within America that stop uh, due process, that, that don't interfere with due process. 
who are law for due process. So when you post a story in Anglican Anthos this week about a uh, priest who was fired by an archbishop in Canada, I said, I don't think that they can do that. But then it's Canada. I better ask George. George, we have reported on uh, kind of ACNA bish uh, people in Canada getting you know elected bishop and promoted, but then that that never pans out. But we never reported on somebody getting fired. Jake Worley, uh, who is a priest in the Anglican Church of Canada, uh, in parish rector in the Diocese of Caledonia, was elected bishop of Caledonia in May, uh, earlier this year, April. I think it was. And the House of Bishops of the province of British Columbia and Yukon refused to accept his election, saying that Worley, having been a member of the AMIA at, in the United States, he left the Episcopal Diocese of the Rio Grande and started a church plant for the AMIA in New Mexico. Because of that, he violated the Lambeth Conference rules against uh, cross-border jurisdiction violations. Therefore, we refuse to certify him as a bishop. And then this past week, and well, they went held a second election, and another conservator was elected who has no AMIA fingerprints on him. And just before this new bishop is seated, the Archbishop of the province, John Privet, telephones where he says, you're fired. And because he's an American citizen, he's got 10 days to get out of Canada because his work permit has been yanked. Now, to me, I don't know the ins and outs of Canadian canon law, and perhaps an archbishop in a province can bypass the, pre the diocese and bypass the diocese and bishop and go down and fire a priest in another diocese. Maybe he has that right, but without review, without eh, it stinks. But you know, Kevin, I think the sadder to me, what's even sadder is the fact that I'm not surprised in the least. No, I mean, to us, and, this is just Canada. Yeah, you know. yeah. I mean this. The, uh, the, 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 the fired priest was not given any notice, not given any explanation for the actions, just told he's gone. And we are so jaded by the hypocrisy and by the unchristian behavior of these Canadian liberal bishops that it's just almost the attitude is, well, why didn't it happen soon? Well, we reported, I think, three or four years ago about a bishop in Canada suing a blogger. Uh, yes. and costing this guy, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And legal fees. Michael <laughs> Bird, the Bishop of uh, Niagara, uh, who's a real piece of work, by the way, uh, was teased by a blogger who juxtaposed a photo of Michael Bird with, uh, I think, North Korean dictator to make the point that the guy is dictatorial and whatnot. And this bishop went to the civil courts to say this this uh, demeaned his professional reputation. Well, first off, the joke is that Michael Bird has no professional reputation <laughs> other than being a, uh, a, rep a reprobate and a, uh, a heretic and a, a lousy bishop whose diocese is in free fall. Mm -hmm. And yet he sues because he's a... F if I were Kim Jong-il, I would have sued I would to, be like in, to Michael <laughs> Bird. Because, I mean, that is more uh, difficult. I mean, at least the North Koreans are successful dictators. They've hold out, held on to power. Yeah. Michael Byrd has managed to destroy the Diocese of Niagara. So I think the sad thing is that the... And there's such hypocrisy because, you know, Michael Byrd and Michael Ingham and all these Canadian liberal bishops have violated all the Lambeth Conference statements and the Anglican Consultative Council statements and the Archbishop of Canterbury's calls not to do ordination of homosexual clergy, not to do gay marriages. They go ahead and do it. Well, yeah, there, there are and they, they're provinces not held, there yeah. where half of the clergy are in some sort of <clears throat> non-traditional marriage marriages. They, so, and Jake Worley is being hammered for violating one Lambeth Conference resolution on cross-border jurisdiction, while the Canadian church is free to violate others uh, on homosexuality and it's is it any wonder that there's a degree of cynicism uh, about you know the Anglican Church of Canada really is in free fall it is dying so rapidly uh, and it's not just because everybody's moving to Florida uh, no I mean there's lots of reasons uh, but they don't have the same rights in Canada that we have we have a much more robust freedom of the press 
much more robust uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion than they do in Canada. Canada uh, is currently cracking down on a lot of those freedoms uh, where they exist. And uh, you look you know, up there at, at fighting abortion is very difficult because you will just be arrested and thrown in jail. Uh, and, and when the Canadian bishops do speak out, yeah. uh, the Bishop of Montreal weighed into uh, fighting the fact that now Muslim women, when they get their driver's licenses, have to take off their veils. She said that's a horrible violation of religious liberty. You know, forget the religious liberty of Christians and anybody else. Yeah. The only time a Canadian bishop will open their mouth is when Muslims are being asked to be like other people and not... What good is a photograph of a woman it, with a full face covering as identification? Uh, her license. No, no absolutely agreed. Uh, but th th this is the, the caliber of the Canadian church right now. They're just jokes. Yes. <laughs> No, we have good friends in Canada. I'm not going to uh, go too much further down this line, but the Anglican Church of Canada um, is a travesty of the witness uh, to anything of the gospel. Uh, that's why they fell so quickly. Um, that's why, you know, you watch, you look what happened in Vancouver with the lawsuits there. You know, the they Church of Canada does not they, release its numbers. Yeah. We don't know how many, are, and so because they, it's things are so bad, mm -hmm. they don't make public reference to how many people. The diocese of, uh, I think Quebec, is got fallen so far so fast that more than half of its members belong to one native, or First Nations they call them Native mm -hmm. American First Nations congregation up in the Arctic Circle, because yeah. everybody else is gone. Yeah, yeah we're and, talking about the province that deposed J. R. Packard. Enough said. That that alone tells you about Canada. Um, let's move on and talk about one of our favorite topics until recently, uh, the Diocese of South Carolina. Uh, yeah, boy, for anybody who's not watched the program in the last uh, six months, Diocese of South Carolina was in court uh, trying to defend their se seal and symbol uh, and properties from the Episcopal Church. Uh, in, everything in law can be convoluted. They had uh, certainly reached it to the point where they were at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of uh, South Carolina rendered a decision that uh, is beyond the pale uh, in comparing to corrupt uh, judicial systems. And I saw this weekend a post you posted on Anglican Inc. where the Southern Baptist and other uh, uh, Protestant churches are gathering together and filing an amicus brief saying, hold on, this is so evil and so wrong, you've raised our ire, we got to say something. Yes, an amicus brief was, was filed on behalf of the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina, the Mark Lawrence Group, by 106 uh, Baptist and independent ministers, Pentecostals. But first off, I think it's fascinating because the Baptists in South Carolina do not normally carry water for the Episcopal Church. No. Or Anglican. Remember, the Baptists anybody, believe yeah. the Episcopal Church as being closet Catholics. I yeah. mean, there's no love loss there. Yet they see what is being done to the diocese as being a travesty of law. And second thing, what I find fascinating is the author the, of the lawyer who filed this amicus brief is Michael McConnell, who's a professor at Stanford University Law School, one of the nation's foremost experts on the law intersection of a law and religion in the United States. Mm -hmm. Stanford is not a hotbed of conservatism. No, nope, not for a long time. No, no not for, for okay, <laughs> maybe in the 20s it was. Yes. But not for, not for our lifetimes. Yeah. And they, and he has stepped in and essentially in polite lawyer language says, this decision is legally ludicrous and was achieved by corrupt means. Now, he doesn't use the word corruption. That's my word. That's our word. But, Somebody's got to say it, though. But the, uh, the law, South Carolina, the diocese, had the law in its favor, had the facts in its favor, and had the president, precedent for precedent, several yeah. hundred years in its favor. Yeah. And a corrupt judge decided to undo all that and have a uh, an outcome that benefited her personally, mm -hmm. that benefited a cause she supports uh, very heavily. And 
This is causing questions in the legislature in Columbia. This is causing the Baptists to get upset. The South Carolina Family Council has uh, filed written articles about this. You're seeing a strange coalition of people gathering together to defend the Episcopal Church from banana republic legal uh, jurisprudence. Uh, well, it's that it, bad. It's that bad. Here's how bad it is. Just a quick analogy. Imagine abortion going before the Supreme Court. And the final person who had the say at the Supreme Court was Margaret Singer. Yeah, that, that is the, this is, you know, about as bad as that. Well, Kevin, what was, well, let's pick, like, so, like, take a true history. Uh, when the uh, gay marriage came before the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. two of the court's justices had already performed gay marriages as civil judges. Uh, 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 Judge Justice Kagan, Kagan. Yeah, and Kagan. Uh, uh, Justice Gin so, uh, Ginsburg. Ginsburg yeah. And mm -hmm. they didn't recuse themselves. And that caused a tiny bit of a stink at the time. But this goes beyond that of degree of that because this is a judge in south carolina who directly benefits whose husband was what is if you will one of the plaintiffs who uh stands to gain uh the return of her own church from bishop lawrence's group and she ruled on those per points this is this is corruption uh this is uh, uh intellectual corruption, political corruption, fiscal corruption. And the South Carolina legal system may, uh, it will survive, but its integrity. Yeah, uh, th this, this is the type done. of thing that, you know, makes it look ridiculous. George, we got just a couple minutes here. Let's report on Newport Beach. Now, this is a saga that took down a bishop that's cost millions of dollars, that has caused the Episcopal Church to have to forgive millions of dollars to the diocese. Um, this is a saga of how not to do church. And it looks like maybe the saga is coming to an end based on reports out of the diocese. The people who were recently in the, the church, St. James Newport Beach, are going to be allowed back in. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yes, the diocese reached an accommodation, an accord, with the congregation at St. James Newport Beach, which has been in exile for a number of years mm -hmm. now. With very bad grace, the diocese has conceded victory to the congregation, meaning uh, they're allowing them to go back in, they're allowing their priest to continue, uh, the diocese is making some piddling demands upon them that, oh, you allow this to be used as a source of mission and ministry, yak, yak, yak. But at the end of the day, the parish is going to become a parish again, and the people can start building the church. But even now, even with a new bishop, John Taylor, they're doing it with such bad grace. Uh, they're, uh, here is the power of the press. Here is the power of a determined congregation and of a powered priest to overturn injustice and the entrenched authority. In other words, the Diocese of Los Angeles had decided, well, so what, Bishop Bruno lost? We're still going to screw you guys anyway. Mm -hmm. and, and even though we're not going to sell this uh, to condo developers, we're not going to allow you all to come back in. We're going to make this an interfaith uh, church rental place. Well, people moaned, people complained, people fought back, and the diocese, with very ill will, has said, okay, you can go back in. Now, they didn't have to do that. But the power of the press, the power of social media, has shamed the bishop uh, and the standing committee into doing the right thing finally. But they still have to be petty about it. Yeah, they're very petty. I mean, this St. James Newport Beach is a terrid story of, you know, many years now, you know, 12, 13, 14 years, where they stood up to then Bishop Bruno said, you know, we got to go a different way. And they fought many years in court. The Episcopal Church fought them every step of the way in court and said, you're not going to have your day in court. We're just going to file appeal after appeal after appeal. And it never went to trial. And finally, after many years, the Supreme Court decided that only the General Convention can sell a church in California. I know. <laughs> you thought South Carolina was crazy? California's crazy, too. And it's interesting to watch, finally, after all this time, 
the oh I hate to use the overuse the word corruption again uh, the evil of the diocese and the bishop at that time uh, is over we hope uh, this has been this has been the soap opera of the Episcopal Church George well the evil the evil was centered in John Bruno mm-hmm but Bruno's staff and his aides continue to populate the higher ranks of the diocese. So Bruno's gone, and Bruno is now fighting a rearguard action to preserve whatever shreds of his dignity he has less. But the new bishop has come in, and the new bishop has turned out to be rather soft in fighting against the entrenched uh, Bruno interests within the hierarchy of the diocese standing committee leaders, the staff that's surrounding him, the financial people, the people complicit in Bruno's bad acts are still there. Mm. And so we have to do one of, think one of two things. Either the bishop is doing the best he can, given whom he is surrounded with, so we should applaud him for his good acts, or, well, let's think the best. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's think the best thing. John Taylor is, you know, it may not be the smoothest, most sweetest way to achieve the right end but the right end has been achieved but uh, bishop taylor clean house you've uh, got a clean house or you're going to be faced the rest of your episcopate with the the re- you don't want to spend your the higher point of your ministry basically putting out john bruno's fires yeah well i think the ultimate justice for saint james would be putting back the original congregation uh that was kicked out because of the california supreme court but I, I, I do get your point. We have come up on 23 minutes. George, we have the most patient audience ever. We thank you guys. Uh, we want you to go about your week. A lot of you guys will be prepping for Thanksgiving and getting ready for family anxieties. We hope uh, that uh, uh, the, the grace of the Lord will get us all through that time of year. Uh, you got any big plans for Thanksgiving, George? Yeah, I'm working, Kevin. You're I'm working. working. <laughs> and never ask me a question about what I'm doing on a holiday. The That's right. is working. <laughs> working. Uh, we are inviting some friends over to the, the condo clubhouse, which over over here on the shore. And every year I, I uh, boil some turkeys in oil, deep fry, I guess you call it, and yeah. have a great time. You know. What? No, it's good. It's juicy. I, I, I was the master of dry turkey for many years. I, I put it in the oven and I would baste it to death and you'd still get you know, a little flaky dry turkey. I've overcome that now. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger and you've been watching episode 342 of Anglican Unscripted.